Hi, Rafael. You're a presidential scholar in society and neuroscience at Columbia University. You have previously completed a PhD in philosophy in Oxford. You're interested in the philosophy of mind, cognitive science, and artificial intelligence. In the past couple of years, you've been discussing at length the recent progress in AI, especially with popular crypto threads on GPT-3, DALI-2, and AGI. You've recently been highly critical of a thesis you call scaling maximalism, and that's one of the reasons you're here today. Thanks, Raphael, for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. Before we go into too much details about the recent progress in AI, I think we should start, uh, like all good philosophers, by some definitions that will help ground the discussion. One of the most heavily loaded terms I use on the podcast is AGI for Artificial General Intelligence. Could you maybe give us a couple of definitions of AGI that people use in practice? Right. Yeah, I think the, the term AGI is one of these terms that uh, annoy a number of people because you can define it in various ways and it has been defined in various ways by, by various people. So there is um, a, 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 you know, a looming threat that uh, you will engage in a verbal dispute where you're just talking past each other because you don't have the same definition of the term. Uh, and that's, I think, uh, a common concern in discussions of AI. But also, um, some of these definitions of AGI might even be, if not unhelpful, um, maybe even uh, borderline incoherent. That's something that uh, Yann LeCun, uh, François Cholet, and other people have suggested. So I think the, the definition of AGI that people tend to find incoherent is the idea of a maximally general intelligence or universal intelligence, right? Um, maybe we can come back to this later, but, you know, if you, if you think of things like the, the free lunch theorem and uh, uh, the idea that even human intelligence is, is, is from, but rather specialized in some ways and this, this kind of consideration, then you might think that this notion of, of AGI as maximally general or universal is uh, misguided. And then, you know, I think... Um, one, I think, uh, rather broad definition that I would be on board with would be something like, um, um, you know, uh, a broad capacity for uh, um, skill acquisition range, uh, 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 across a broad range of, of different uh, tasks um, with you know, some limited amount of prior knowledge and prior experience uh, required for generalizing across these tasks, right? So um, there you have the general aspect of intelligence as a spectrum uh, where uh, your generalization power across new tasks is specifically like uh, unknown tasks that are widely out of the range of tasks you've encountered before is one of the key uh, aspects of, of this generality. And so then you can compare different systems uh, with respect to how general their intelligence is with this kind of a broad definition. And, you know, you might consider, and I would consider personally, for example, with this kind of definition in mind, that some non-human animals uh, exhibit some form of general biological or natural intelligence. Um, but it's interesting because when you talk about AGI with AI people, people these days think immediately of something like superhuman intelligence uh, rather than something like, you know, uh, rodent level intelligence, uh, which is also fairly general if you think of what a rat can do. Um, so, so, but building on this kind of definition, because it's a, it's a, it's a definition that's uh, where, where the generality is relative and, and, you know, pertains to comparing different systems, then you can extrapolate from there and, and define a kind of intelligence that is more general than that of a rat, and in fact, than that of a human, possibly, uh, because I don't think many people would be suggesting that humans um, have, you know, in principle, you know, are the pinnacle of, of generalization power, right? So you can think potentially of a, of a system or a creature uh, that could generalize even better than humans or, or across a broader range of tasks. So then you, you get into this idea of AGI that's related to superhuman intelligence. But I think we should indeed leave uh, the maximalist definition uh, or the idea of like universal intelligence 
to the side because it's it's not very helpful. Right. So you you will get some general animal intelligence, and then general human intelligence, and then after that you would get super intelligence. Superhuman intelligence. Yeah. I mean, it, it's 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 um. It's tricky, though, of course, because many people would would argue that intelligence is a multidimensional construct. Um, it's perhaps also depending on how exactly you define it. It could be context sensitive in some ways, uh, and in that respect, you you can have uh, a system. I mean, this is a banal observation these days, but you can have a system that is uh, that has superhuman intelligence uh, in some respect and uh, subhuman intelligence in another. So. Uh, right, so you can think, you know, I mean, if you think if if you think of it in terms of narrow skills, this is very obvious. You know, AlphaGo is has superhuman uh, uh, abilities in 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 Go playing, uh, but you know, is is uh, in, completely incapable of doing a bunch of other things we can do. So, yeah, that's why I think the definition of super intelligence from Bostrom's book with the same name is useful because it defines it as having orders of magnitude, um, more intelligence than humans in economically viable tasks. Uh, so all of, you know, what humans would consider useful for our, our, our economy, uh, machines could do it, um, orders of magnitude, like 10 times, um, faster or, or better. And how we define intelligence is in, in a very practical way where intelligence is just the ability to achieve our, your goal. So if the goal is like designing chips or driving a car, if you're like 10 times safer in driving the car or you produce 10 times more chips per hour, then you're more intelligent in that sense. And so your definition of like superhuman intelligence um, with like different levels of generality, I would say that it's it's interesting, um, but uh, like in practice, we would not really care uh, because it would be like out of our, 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 our scope. And, and I think when we think about the future, like we care about like human level <laughs> and we care when like it's sm smarter than us in a way that like we're not really useful anymore. What do you make of those definitions? So I'm not a huge fan of, of this characterization of general artificial intelligence or artificial general intelligence as a characterization of intelligence, because I think it's not really a definition of intelligence. It's more of a, of a kind of behavioral correlates of uh, intelligence given a specific set of background assumptions. So the range of tasks that are economically valuable in a given society or world or universe is, is very context relative, right? So um, if you think of uh, that there is you know, nuclear war uh, and, uh, and a global collapse of society, perhaps the range of economically valuable tasks uh, that we care about and that humans can accomplish will be vastly restricted such that uh, a system that today we would consider fairly unintelligent could be better than human humans at this task. You know, that might just boil down to basic farming tasks, for example, right? So this is why I'm not a big fan of this definition because I don't think it's really a definition of intelligence. It's more of a, of a kind of um, um, uh, characterization of some behavioral correlates of general intelligence given a set of background assumptions about what humans find about economically valuable. Yeah, so I, I think you could always find some like specific states of our economy or um, world where we're in a nuclear war and there's like only this and this that is useful. And, and okay, so the definition adapts to those kind of situations. But at the end of the day, what counts is like what fraction of the GDP is produced by humans versus machines. And if, I don't know, 20% of our economy is automated and uh, then that gives us roughly some sense on where we are in terms of automation. And when we get to like 98%, so it, for me, it's more like about a continuum, right? Um, and before we reach like 100%, um, we might get to 95% and the only people doing useful work would be like the AI researchers. Um, and, and I think it's um, interesting to come back to what you said about behavioral, behavioral, <laughs> sorry about my English. Yeah. Um, how would you define behavioral um, yeah, intelligence and yeah, what, what's the difference between, in philosophy between like behaviors and knowledge or, or, or understanding, if, if any? Yeah, so 
you have a lot of uh, definitions of intelligence and specifically AI or artificial intelligence that focus on on behavior because it's it's easier. So um, behavior would be any kind of observable output uh, of the system, whether it's uh, you know generated text or images for systems like GPT-3 or DALI, or whether it's it's actually acting out in the world, if it's some kind of embodied system like a robot or you know acting in a virtual environment for a uh, reinforcement learning agent or something like that, right? So um, you can focus on behavior and uh, that was... In fact, the the strategy that that Alan Turing adopted in in, in his paper seminal paper on whether machines can think, where he's he he's uh, his um, his claim was that we should not bother too much with the question can machines think, but we should instead focus on uh, a behavioral uh, test, which is the imitation game, the Turing test, uh, and this is the same kind of definition that was then favored by people like. Uh, Minsky and, and McCarthy and others, uh, some of the founding fathers of AI uh, um, in the 50s, namely that you know we should uh, focus on the range of tasks that a system can achieve. Um, and so you can contrast this kind of behavioral definition of intelligence with definitions that appeal to intrinsic capacities of systems. Um, so, you know, there, there are... Sometimes uh, I call these definitions mentalist definitions because they often appeal to you know to mental capacities or cognitive capacities. You could you could call them cognitive definitions as well. Um, that there would be a nice parallel with the the uh, you know evolution of cognitive science or you know psychology generally from behaviorism to to the cognitive turn uh, in the sixties. So uh, uh, once upon a time psychology was entirely focused on the observation of behavior and correlations between between inputs and outputs and then moved towards making hypotheses about cognitive processes and what's going on on the inside under the hood in uh in in systems like uh, animals and humans and so similarly you can focus on a definition of intelligence that appeals to cognitive skills cognitive capacities um and i'm uh, personally, quite sympathetic to that second uh, approach to intelligence. I think if you really want to disentangle uh, what is really an intense of intelligence and what is not, you need to uh, make some informed hypotheses about uh, the mechanisms that that are that are uh, at play in these systems, right? You see that with GPT-3 and language models generally these days, people are amazed by their performance, but uh, there are endless discussions about what that performance actually means and how it can be explained by what's actually happening in the system. And I think we can't escape these kind of discussion about what's going on inside the system. In the context of a Chinese room experiment, uh... Do you think the system is actually um, intelligent or not? By the system, you mean uh, GPT-3? When, when the, you, you have like a, so so some human in a in a room and oh, he, had, he has a manual where he can translate Chinese right. and so for people who are not familiar, like you get in in entry in input to get like some English text and then you have a a big dictionary when you can like uh, map English words to Chinese words and things like some very specific rules. And at the end, it yeah. outputs like the translated text. Um, right. So, so yeah, the, the Chinese room argument from John Searle is this, this old argument in philosophy uh, to uh, that purports to show that um, um, the kind of at least algorithms that uh, existed at the time uh, could not uh, have any understanding of of language. So the idea is that you have uh, a person, an operator in a room. Uh, that gets as input some uh, Chinese symbols and has this big rule book uh, uh, or manual uh, that's essentially a giant lookup table that can match uh, input strings to output strings uh, based on various rules. Um, and so uh, this operator in the room is an English speaker who doesn't speak any Chinese and yet can take these inputs, Chinese symbols, look up what is the corresponding output in the manual, 
and then output uh, Chinese symbols. And through that kind of procedure could converse with some Chinese speakers outside of the room uh, in a way that would be indistinguishable from a fluent uh, Chinese speaker, even though the operator in the room has no understanding of Chinese. And uh, John Cell pumps intuitions with that kind of experiment, thought experiments to suggest that machines can't have any understanding. Um, it's a very, it's an infamous exp thought experiment in philosophy. I, I would say like, uh, most people, especially working on artificial intelligence these days, are, uh, uh, you know, range from, uh, being indifferent to that experiment, to being thought experiments, to being pretty annoyed by it, uh, and by its on enduring, uh, popularity, because there are a lot of things that you can, um, dispute about how this experiment, thought experiment is set up, um, how it's pumping intuitions. And there is also an ongoing discussion about the, the real value um, and of, of thought experiments in science and philosophy and how much you can uh, infer from this kind of thought experiment. But I would, I'm, you know, I, I think um, in the way the thought experiment is set up with, you know, this like, slow human operator looking at a giant lookup table. Uh, my intuition is that indeed uh, neither the operator nor perhaps the whole system com that includes the operator and the room has any understanding of Chinese. Now, if you modify the experiment to look a bit more like, uh, you know, modern language models, then things get less obvious and uh but i think one of the key you know one of the key uh replies to the chinese room arguments the so-called systems reply is that you shouldn't look at whether the operator in the room has an understanding of chinese but at whether the whole system including the operator and the rule book the manual and the you know and the room itself has an understanding of chinese because in the analogy the operator is a bit like the cpu executing instructions um, and you would have to include the whole system that includes, you know, uh, the, the, the algorithm encoded in the manual and, uh, and, and, uh, I think, you know, the, the, the whole mechanism that gets you from input to output and so on. But anyway, yeah, not a huge fan of that, that particular thought experiment. <laughs> yeah. I think my point was mostly that in, if you consider the, the whole system, even if, so, so you, it's a, an example of a system that could have a behavior um, that is useful, like translating English to Chinese without having some understanding. And I guess what you meant was um, re replacing this rule book with a transformer. Um, when, when you get like a large language model that translates uh, effectively English to Chinese without actually having an understanding of the world, and it, it wouldn't really be able to explain thoroughly um, what is um, a cup of water and why humans drink water, but it's still able to like translate all the sentences related to cup of waters. Um, I think that's like um, some somewhat similar, uh, even if uh, yeah, the technology is quite different from uh, the 1960s to today. And yeah, what, what you were saying is that yeah, mostly you're mostly concerned about understanding and at the end of the, of the day, we, we might end up with AIs that are similar to transformers and GPT three, and that could, you know, have an impact in the world without having a perfect understanding of everything they're doing, but still have a massive economic impact. Um, and, um, yeah, perhaps if we include in understanding, like having some like human experience of life, uh, maybe they will never have a human experience or a consciousness or, 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 or anything related, but they will still be able to, you know, um, transform the world, um, as we know it. Yeah. So I think there are a number of things we have to keep distinct here, uh, in this kind of discussion, right? So one thing is, um, whether or not a system has the kind of impact that a system has in the real world in terms of, you know, for example, accomplishing economically valuable tasks or being able to perform a bunch of other tasks that we care about. And it's true that people in AI, in the industry especially, and uh, it's perhaps less true for some 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 labs or some, some groups, uh, uh, DeepMind, for example, cares more about some of the 
um, the more um, substantive questions about the capacities of the systems. But a lot of groups in, in the AI industry care more about, you know, building things that can do certain things and don't care that much about um, how they do these things as long as they can do them, right? So uh, a lot of people building language models, for example, um, don't really care that much about whether these models have an understanding of language and, and so on. Um, now, um, there, are, there are, I think, other things we should keep separate. So um, there's one question, which is whether um, algorithms like language models have an understanding of natural language and the meaning of words and sentences. There is a question that's related but distinct about whether algorithms, whether language models or other, like reinforcement learning algorithms, have an understanding of the world. Um, so, you know, these two things are related, but not, not, not quite uh, equivalent. Um, and I mean, perhaps we can come back later at some point, like on uh, to the, the the kind of uh, modernized version of the Chinese room argument that has been proposed by 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 uh, Bender and Kohler uh, in the form of the op octopus test, even in a paper called "Climbing Toward Natural Language Understanding" that was published a few years ago. That's an argument that pertains to language understanding, and the idea is the following: so, um, it, it, it's you know trying to pump intuitions in a way that that is more um, um, adapted to the kind of technology we have today as opposed to the, the good old-fashioned algorithms that John Searle was concerned with. So imagine that you have uh, two uh, remote islands somewhere in the Pacific Ocean that are you know, not too far away from each other, and you have uh, stranded humans, one on each of these islands, um, that communicate with each other through a kind of telegraph system with a deep sea cable. And you have an octopus, a very, very smart octopus um, that is uh, somehow tapping into this, this, this deep sea cable and starting to listen to the conversations between the two, the two humans. Um, now imagine that, um, and again, all these thought experiments require a lot of imagination and that's part of the problem, but imagine that this octopus uh, somehow, you know, can by by uh, eavesdropping on the conversations between the two humans, uh, generally gradually builds some kind of statistical model of language uh, uh, based on the distributional statistics of of, of uh, how, how words are used by these these two humans um, to such an extent that eventually it can. Uh, uh, Kind of hack the, the the communication system and insert itself and uh, talk with either one of the humans or, or both, maybe both of them, maybe just one of them, uh, pretending to be the other human, right? So you can just like intercept communications and replace them, for example, um, based on the information it has gathered about the the distributional statistics of uh, words, just by listening in on conversations, it might be the case that uh, this uh, smart octopus is able to do a very good job at convincing humans on the islands that um, they are talking to the other human when in fact they are interacting with the octopus that is just outputting some strings uh, based on distributional information. Um, now, what Benner and Kohler say is that the octopus um, that has uh, no... Uh, you know, it's a deep sea creature that has no um, it interaction with uh, the world above the surface, uh, wouldn't really understand what it's talking about when it's talking about things that's happening on these islands, such as, for example, if um, I, I can't remember exactly how they set up this uh, part of the, uh, the thought experiment, but some something like if one of the humans uh, is concerned with uh, how to build a catapult, um, um, the octopus might, you know, um, output some sentences about that, but would have no underlying understanding of, of uh, how a catapult works, what is required to build one with a coconut and so on, and, um, you know, how that works in the real world, right? Um, and the broader point of Ben Arancola's paper is to say, well, there is this distinction in linguistics uh, between at least in like classical Saussurian linguistics, 
between things like form and meaning. Um, and so all the octopus is interacting with is the form of linguistic items. So the, the kind of text string, it depends on whether this is like uh, audio communication or text communication, but it's just, let's assume it's just text, written text. Um, so it has, uh, uh, it, it can only uh, uh, kind of call, gather information about the distributional statistics of, of uh, these text strings. So the form of, of linguistic items but it doesn't really have any grasp of the meaning of linguistic items where meaning is understood is cashed out in terms of, of some kind of relationship to the world and to the reference of words in the world. Um, now I think, um, um, so I'm, I'm kind of, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm kind of um, ambivalent about this whole argument on the one hand, I, and that's, that's probably going to be the theme of this conversation because I, I generally take the middle ground between, uh, you know, hardline skepticism and and uh, AI hype and evangelism. Um, so I think I think it's right to say that systems like this fictional octopus or current language models don't understand language in the way humans do. They don't learn language and acquire language uh, in the way children do. And there are various reasons to think that their uh, understanding of language is at the very least quite limited. That being said, I think there are a few things in that particular paper and thought experiment that are debatable. Um, one is the uh, very stark distinction between form and meaning um, because um, you know this distinction might not always be so absolute um, there are some domains in which um, the the form of linguistic items has some non-trivial relationship to uh, the meaning of linguistic items there's this thing called sound symbolism for example uh, in linguistics, there are experiments on this. If you um, um, ask uh, people to relate made-up words to shapes, uh, they would tend to associate uh, the made-up word kiki with uh, a spiky shape more than a, a round shape, and you know, and vice versa for other you know other words that sound differently. So. Uh, there are properties, formal properties of linguistic items that can have non-trivial relationships to their reference. Um, there are also some, I mean, we, we probably can't go into details on, on that. And I'm, I'm currently working on a, on a paper that gets into these, these ideas. But I think there are, there are other ways in which the form meaning distinction is a little bit more porous and fuzzy than bender and color allow it to be. So that's one thing. And then the other thing is that they bring in some considerations about the modeling of communicative int intent, for example, uh, as one of the shortcomings of the octopus so it, on, and language models. So it doesn't really have any notion of the communicative intent of the speaker, human speakers on the island. Um, and I think that's also bringing a notion that it's perhaps, you know, uh, meddling the waters a little bit because uh, muddying the waters a little bit because it's, it's, um, it's kind of um, bringing together different issues. One of, one of them is uh, the classic notion of, of referential grounding. So grounding, you know, your understanding of words into uh, some kind of uh, capacity to grasp the reference out, out there in the real world, um, uh, presumably th through some kind of uh, direct or indirect uh, uh, causal historical interaction with the reference in the real world. Um, and another issue is, is modeling of communicative intent, right? So trying to understand where, what exactly someone means in conversation. There might be some misunderstandings of communicative intent, uh, even in our conversation in this podcast, right? Even though we do both have the capacity to, to, to ground our understanding of word meanings into, um, some knowledge about that reference in the world, right? So that's, I think the, the modeling of communicative intent is a distinct issue that comes apart from the issue of referential grounding. So that's another respect in which I think this paper 
might conflate issues that we should keep separate. So, so yeah, I have I have these concerns, and I and I and I I don't want to overstate that claim too much, but I would be prepared to say that language models, in principle, language models of the kinds we have today, can have some form of semantic competence um, that falls short of what we would call human level language understanding for various reasons. But that also is not equivalent to um, something like, you know, Eliza in the 60s, the kind of symbol manipulations it was limited to, or indeed equivalent to uh, stochastic parrots, if you take this, this uh, influential metaphor proposed also by Emily Bender and Tim Nitkebru and colleagues. So I think the stochastic parrots metaphor is short selling the competence of language models. Uh, and, I, and, I, and I have this kind of middle view that tries to do justice to what these models can do without inflating and anthropomorphizing what they can do. I think most people in the ML community would agree that we're very far from Elisa right now and they have some competence and they're still uh, beneath um, semantic understanding of, from humans. So I, I don't think your take is super controversial. No, I agree. I think it should be a very reasonable take. Uh, <clears throat> but it's interesting because it's probably a kind of silent majority view, but um, discussions, debates on, on social media, like, like Twitter, for example, tend to uh, give more visibility to the more extreme paralyzed views, perhaps. Sure. And yeah, the previous guest on our podcast was Ethan Caballero, who was on an extreme that you called um, scaling maximalism that we will um, talk about later. But uh, just to go back to your analogy with um, the octopus, I like it because it's the octopus has eight uh, arms and um, like that, and you know, a transformer with like eight attention heads or something. Um, and yeah, it's really close to uh, modeling the understanding of a, a large language model. And in some sense, what you said about communication intent so to have communication intents, you need to say something because you want um, an impact in the world. You want a consequence. I say something to you because I want you to get the information I'm transmitting and maybe like do something about it. But there's also the way in which when you start a word um, in a, and, and then a, you start a sentence or a paragraph, you're like, you try to push the essay in a certain direction and if you're only like predicting the next token without like having a clear plan of what you're going to say in like three pages, then you're kind of doing this stochastic part thing where you're um, saying something coherent without really aiming for like a particular direction in your wording. Um, and, and I think, yeah, one of the first time I've seen your name was two years ago um, when you did some relatively impressive um, text generation with GPT-3 um, where you gave as input uh, text from famous philosophers. Um, and then you gave, so GPT-3 uh, had to answer those and you maybe generated multiple times uh, certain paragraphs to, to have the, the right ones. But um, yeah, if, if you want to just like talk a little bit about it, uh, I would be curious to, to hear your take on this. Yeah, so that was in the early days of GPT-3. It seems like so long ago already, but... Uh, it is long, so long ago, two years ago. Yeah, which is a lifetime in, in AI research, exactly. Yeah, it was in the early days, and so I was, I was you know, um, playing with early access to the model and uh, to the API, and, and um, at the time, there was this, um, uh, this blog post that was making the rounds that, uh, on, on a website called Daily News, that's a website... Um, uh, used by the philosophy profession. Um, and there was a guest post on that website, which was a, a, an edited collection of very short essays about GPT-3 from various philosophers. Um, and I thought at the time that, um, in my opinion, some of these essays were a little bit missing the importance or the, you know, the, 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 the significance of GPT-3 as a, as a, technological innovation, um, but also, you know, falling into some of the common pitfalls such as uh, 
saying, oh, well, it's just statistical pattern matching or things like that, which, you know, is, is rather uninformative because you could describe a lot of what humans do as statistical pattern matching as well. But anyway, I, I thought, you know, just for fun, I would collect these essays together and prompt GPT-3 with these essays and ask GPT-3 to produce an essay in response to these essays. Um, and what I did then, and I, I further had to clarify this on Twitter because uh, people were jumping at my throat for cherry picking. So I, I did uh, generate a few um, uh, outputs for each, for each, you know, two three paragraphs, and then um, mix and match the results to produce a longer essay. But there was not a lot of cherry picking, honestly. Uh, and the essay we, it produced was very impressive in my opinion. I mean, again, with some editing on my part, but um, something that, you know, required really minimal effort for me. And if it was coming from one of my first year philosophy students would not be a great essay, but wouldn't be the worst essay either. You know, it would be like a kind of run of the mill, slightly mediocre, but not awful, you know, essay would get probably a, a, a fairly decent grade, especially with great inflation these days. So, um, you know, and, and I, and I was kind of telling my colleagues on Twitter, uh, you know, watch out for this stuff. It's, it's, it's coming for, for, you know, it's coming to college students and you have to think twice in the future about the kind of assignments you give to students in terms of essay writing. Yeah. I'm curious. Um, do you see a future for philosophy professors in, um, correcting essays, um, like, how do you grade essays uh, when, like in 2025, when people will have access to something that doesn't generate like three paragraphs, but maybe like entire pages or multiple pages? Like, how will you keep up with those advances? Yeah, it's a, it's a hard question. It depends on what you're trying to assess. So if you're just trying to assess stuff like, um, um, you know, like... Uh, general knowledge of this, like kind of encyclopedic knowledge about a subject. So say I, I give, you know, I teach a class on the philosophy of AI and I want to see whether my students have like memorized what the Chinese room is and what are the main objections to the Chinese room and so on, Chinese room argument. Um, uh, then, you know, uh, giving that out as a essay at home would be kind of worthless as at assessing that because, uh, um, that was already the case before, right? Because people can just look things up on Wikipedia and just, Copy pay. We have plagiarism detectors, of course, uh, turn it in and this kind of software. But um, you can always rephrase, paraphrase Wikipedia, and that wouldn't trigger the detectors. And so, in that sense, you know, the advent of language models is not really changing anything. You know, students can paraphrase stuff they see on the internet. Now, if you want to assess uh, reasoning and argumentative skills in addition to knowledge. That's where things get a little bit murkier. I would argue with current transformer models, uh, there are still questions you can ask to students where, you know, really showing a deep understanding and capacity to reason about the topic is out of reach for current models. So if you ask the right questions, I think, you know, you would still, you, you would still be hard pressed to find, uh, you know, a, a relevant, efficient use of these models. But, you know, how long is that going to be true? I don't know. When will we be out of job? Well, I don't, I don't think the job of a philosophy professor is to uh, grade essays, thank God, because, you know, like the, <laughs> that's, the, that's probably the worst part of the job. So I would be happy for this to, like, go away. Uh, and in fact, you know, I'm not the biggest um, cheerleader of, of grades. So I think, you know, the kind of signal... Uh, reinf you know, if you think of, of it in terms of reinforcement learning, the kind of, of, of reward or punishments uh, that you get from grades is not always the best learning signal. And uh, there are multiple, you know, many studies about this uh, in, in pedagogy and psychology. And um, in some ways, I think if we shift away from this kind of uh, narrow graded assignment, that wouldn't be such a bad thing. But if you want to, if you want to stick with essay writing, you can always like assign essays in class in limited time, you know. Uh, which is something that we do a lot in France, for example. We don't do that much, uh, as you as you as you know. We don't do that much um, essay writing at home, right? We do this thing called dissertation in, in class in limited time. Uh, in fact, in my own education, because I went through the French system that goes crazy for this kind of assignment, uh, 
I went through this uh, um, exam, entrance exam for this school called the uh, Economist Superior, and then took this exam called the Aggregation. And for this, you have seven hour long essays in, in class, right, with someone watching you. So like you have to sit for seven hours and write an essay under close supervision without access to a computer and or a dictionary or anything. Uh, so, you know, I mean, if that's, if that's <laughs> the kind of assignment you want to give, I'm not personally convinced it's the right kind of assignment, but you can always do that, right? So, And at, at that time, you, you will have brain computer interfaces dictating GPT-5 output in your <laughs> in your brain directly. Exactly, you'll be you'll be plugged in th through GPT, GPT-20 uh, with Neuralink, and yeah. But I mean, more seriously though, to come back to these experiments with GPT-3 initially, um, it prompted me to write this essay at the time, this general audience essay about transformer models. And what struck me is that um, one way to characterize what they do, which I think still today is perhaps more informative than the stochastic pirates metaphor, is that they're very good bullshitters. Uh, in a technical sense of bullshit that was given by the philosopher Harry Frankfurt, so he wrote a very uh, fun essay called On Bullshit. And he gives this definition of bullshit, which is uh, basically producing some kind of outputs such as text or speech uh, with w w w w that that's purely optimized to convince people without uh, or compel people without any intrinsic regard for truth or falsity, right? So that's what a bullshitter is doing, uh, you know. Uh, and I think, you know, the, straightforwardly what these this autoregressive models are doing is is very good bullshit, right? It's 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 producing statistically likely strings one after the other, so you know, statistically plausible speech. Uh, without any intrinsic regard for truth or falsity. Um, and so this is why I think, um, you know, even the stochastic pirates metaphor is short-selling what these models can do a little bit because they're not literally pirating uh, speech, right? So um, I think there is this sentence from the stochastic, stochastic pirates paper that um, these models are pirates because they're haphazardly stitching together sequences from the training data. And I think we have good evidence that this is not actually what these models are doing. There, there, there is some memorization that can happen, but it's not, you know, they, by and large, they can produce completely novel outputs that are not just uh, a matter of stitching together n-grams from the, you know, training data. Uh, what they do is much more sophisticated. Um, and so I think if you want to have a, a somewhat deflationary take on what they do, perhaps a better metaphor and a more accurate metaphor would be a stochastic chameleon, uh, something that can kind of seamlessly blend in different domains and different regimes of speech and, you know, different topics, different styles. You see it with also text to image models, uh, seamlessly uh, adopt the style of different painters or adopt the stylistic, you know, the mannerisms of speech of different authors. Uh, and talk about any topic without any intrinsic regard for truth or falsity. And now then the question is, you know, when do we cross over and move beyond this kind of artificial mimicry, uh, this kind of stochastic chameleon behavior, cross over into something that looks more like actual reasoning and understanding? And of course, that's the million dollar question. I think it's always a question of out of distribution generalization. So the, the chameleon you describe is able to, you know, fit in high dimensional space between a couple of data points, and you can like transition between one data point to another in a smooth way because the chameleon, you know, changes its color. And right. at that moment, you're kind of doing high dimensional interpolation, which is a hard problem. And so, right. you, but it's still you're still inside your training data. And I think the most robust or difficult definition of intelligence or general intelligence would be to be able to generalize to out of distribution. Like you're, you're seeing something from a, a, an alien life form and then you, you, you get to the problem of, you know, no free lunch theorem or, or like it's impossible to generalize to anything at all. So, uh, but I, I think with Gato or those um, RL task um, that has been going on um, in the past few weeks, you get some of generalization um, 
and you're able to like do very well on a bunch of different tasks. Um, and yeah, I, I think one, one way of to measure if you're, you know, really, um, uh, I don't know, a dog, a monkey, I think a monkey is able to learn tasks very well. Um, if, if you're not a um, stochastic chameleon, but a, an actual monkey or chimpanzee able to like learn new tasks, then you'll be like able to learn zero shot or few shot uh, new tasks, right? And what GPT-3 showed that was that it was able to be fine-tuned to completely new domains and get good performance. And on top of that, do very well in future learning on some arithmetic task or, or something else. So I think we're getting closer to, you know, animal intelligence um, and human intelligence in that regard. Yeah, I think, I think that's right. I mean, uh, indeed what you can, you can think of what the chameleon is doing as uh, sampling uh, uh, color space and then interpolating within color space, right? Uh, and you can similarly think of what some deep learning models are doing, just sampling, you know, uh, uh, you know, projecting some some uh, some some features of the input into latent space and then interpolating within latent space. Um, and I think you know people like uh, François Cholet, for example, have been going on for a long time about how that's the the big limitation of deep learning. So uh, I think someone like him uh, think that this is an intrinsic limitation of deep learning, that it's always, um, um, you know, dealing with uh, continuous uh, interpolative data uh, that lies on some kind of manifold and can only do like geometric transforms from one manifold to another uh, that doesn't enable true extrapolation and generalization um and, but you know i mean you have you 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 have some dis, some debates about this i, I there is this paper from from Yann de Kuhn, uh, and others i can't exactly remember arguing that uh interpolation in very high dimensional space is all you know amounts to extrapolation or something like that, something along these lines right so um it probably depends on how exactly you define extrapolation and interpolation. There is also probably some verbal disputes going on there, but um, but I do agree that we are heading towards greater and greater capacities for generalization. That being said, I think we shouldn't overstate um, the kind of generalization that current models can do. Right. So if you take the the Gato or Gato, I'm not sure how it's supposed to be pronounced, but paper from DeepMind. What's actually striking is that there is not that much transfer learning going on from what I've been reading, right? So it's actually, it's, you know, it's, it's just trained on a bunch of different things and it does okay, you know, at these different tasks, not amazing. You know, it's not great that uh, um, text generation is not great that uh, uh, language vision tasks, uh, it's pretty good at like playing Atari games, but um, not as good as, you know, uh, models that have been, uh, fine-tuned for specific games. But interestingly, you know, training it on a bunch of different things with a bunch of different serialized data doesn't seem to be massively, to provide a massive performance gain in the way that you you might, you know, especially if you're a scaling maximalist, you, you might expect um, uh, this to happen at some point, and maybe it will happen at a greater scale. But um, so I don't know how much generalization there is from a system like, like, uh, Gato, honestly, uh, uh, by which I mean, I don't know how much out of domain generalization you observe. Um, <clears throat> and you do get this phenomenon of like few shot learning with GPT-3. Again, I think there is a valid question to be asked about how much, how, how, how much of a generalization that really constitutes as opposed to just guiding through prompt engineering, guiding the model to sample the right region of the latent space. Right. So, um, I don't really, I, the, the initial GPT-3 paper, like the, the original paper talks of, of about future learning as a form of meta learning and for like later paper have dropped that kind of terminology. I think indeed this would, this was quite confusing, first of all, because there are different definitions of meta learning, like in, in reinforcement learning, people talk about meta learning to mean something else, but also because, you know, it's not really learning how to learn It's just, um, abstracting some patterns from the prompt that has a certain structure to essentially like sample the right region of its ginormous latent space. But there is no real, you know, there is no, there is no, certainly no uh, uh, 
changes in the way it's happening uh, uh, when you do future learning. Uh, so the, even even the term learning there is perhaps a bit of a misnomer. And so I do, yeah, I do I do worry about how much and I worry no, I don't worry about it, but like how much you know how much you can call it um, generalization, especially if you mean something like out of domain generalization. Right. So I think what you're referring to is that you're not changing something in the memory of a language model when you're doing few shot learning, but you're rather accessing a certain part of you know the weights. Um, you're activating certain parts of the weights by starting by you know a prompt that says the task number task number one is this, task number two is this. Please do task number three. Um, right. So you're kind of accessing something by from engineering. So I agree with yeah. that uh, claim. And I agree also that from what I've seen, uh, there, there was not a lot of transfer learning happening in Gato. I think what it showed was mostly that you could have like a single architecture that did a bunch of different things um, with um, a recon, only like something very close to a transformer. And with the same process of tokenization would be uh, for language, for vision, um, for robotic task, but yeah, that's not maybe that's not truly relevant for um, out of distribution generalization. Maybe I mean yeah, maybe maybe one 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 the distinction that's helpful there is um, uh, again from from Francis Chollet's uh, paper on the measure of intelligence, which I, I quite like, uh, is um, this distinction between I think it distinguishes between three levels of generalization. So you have local generalization, which um, is a narrow form of generalization that pretends to uh, general, generalizing to uh, known unknowns, so within a specific task. So that can be just, for example, you have a classifier that classifies um, pictures of dogs and cats, and then you can generalize to unseen examples you know, at test time that it hasn't seen during training. So that's local generalization is just within domain um, known unknowns on a specific task. Then there is what he calls broad generalization that's generalizing to unknown unknowns within a broad range of tasks. So the examples he gives there would be like level five self-driving or the Wozniak test, uh, which uh, was proposed by Steve Wozniak, which is you know building a system that can walk into a room, find the coffee maker and brew a good cup of coffee. Um, so these are kind of tasks like or capacities that require adapting to novel situations, including scenarios that were not foreseen by the programmers, where, you know, because there are so many like edge cases in driving or indeed in, in walking into an apartment, finding a coffee maker of some kind and making a cup of coffee. Um, there are so many potential edge cases and, you know, uh, this very long tail of, of uh, you know, unlikely but possible situations where you can find yourself. Um, you have to to adapt more flexibly to this kind of thing, and so that requires this kind of broader generalization. Um, and then there is a valid question about this this level two from Cholet about where do current models fit? You know, can we say that current language models are capable of uh, some kind of broader generalization because of their future learning capacities? I suspect Cholet would say no. Um, because it's not, it's not really, uh, there is a difference between being able to perform tasks that you haven't been explicitly trained to do, which is what's happening with future learning. So you don't explicitly train Palm or GPT or uh, three uh, on arithmetic problems, say, but then it so happens that it can perform some arithmetic tasks after training. So there's a difference between that and being between being able to uh, generalize to truly out of domain uh, tasks, right? And you could you could given the training set of GPT three and Palm that includes a bunch of text talking about arithmetic and and involving math problems and so on, uh, you might very reasonably say that arithmetic tasks are not really out of distribution, right? They're 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 within the training set. Uh, so I suspect Shelley would say this is not, we, we're not yet at broad generalization. And then you have what he calls level three, which is extreme generalization, um, 
which is the capacity to generalize across the generalize to unknown unknowns across an unknown range of tasks that is very very broad so it's not just about you know uh driving around or making a cup of coffee but basically generalizing to perhaps not any kind of problem but but you know within some reasonable constraints virtually any kind of problem in the way humans can uh, do right and do this very efficiently uh with minimal um you know try not minimal trials so do it do this zero shot or one shot like doing things like you know putting a man on the moon uh uh zero shot or, or one shot few shot perhaps um you know that's very complex problems that we've never encountered before uh in a wide range of possibilities so so i think that's kind of it's helpful to 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 have this distinction in mind and I do, yeah. I mean, I, I think it would be worth asking uh, everyone you have on your podcast, maybe like, you know, do you think current models can achieve broad generalization in Scholes' sense? Yeah, I guess it depends on the timelines you ask, right? Um, is it, is it kind of something impossible for humans to do, to, to, to build, or if it's impossible to century or to decade? But yeah, to come back to just the um, Steve Wozniak definition, I don't fully understand what's the setting. So do can you train your model uh, in like waking up in different rooms and doing like um, brewing coffee in different rooms or different apartments and then it like encounters a new apartment and, and has to do this? Or it, it has to like learn how to do this by never interacting with a, a flat? So I think the coffee test is as, as formulated by Wozniak is like uh, under specified. So um, you can have various interpretation of the test and various difficulties, I uh, I think the general general test in a, in its very s simple formulation would just be like uh, train your model however you want or like design your system however you want. It has to be able to just walk into a room, find a coffee maker, brew a good cup of coffee. Uh, so you're free to train your system on a bunch of uh, virtual apartments with coffee maker, virtual coffee makers, or indeed train it in the real world with a robot, uh, with real apartments and real coffee machines. Um, I guess that does raise a question though, you know, at which point you can just brute, brute force the problem uh, in an interpolative regime by just having encountered so many different situations, so many different apartments with every possible con conceivable coffee machine ever made by humans that you can just kind of uh solve this as a kind of uh interpolative problem but I, I i don't know that it whether that would even make sense given the the kind of um uh you know the other aspect of this test which is like the the complexity of of having a dexterous robot that can manipulate objects uh seamlessly and the kind of thing that we're still struggling with today in robotics uh which is another that's another interesting thing that you know we've, we've made so much progress with um, uh, disembodied models, uh, and uh, there are a lot of ideas flying around with robotics. But in some respect, the setup of the art in robotics, that the, the models from Boston Dynamics, uh, are not using deep learning, right? So uh, there's still this gap between what we can do with disembodied models and what we can do in the real world. Right, so I think there's a question of dexterity. Then there's the vision. And um, yeah, be able to you know classify images and see you know coffee maker. I think that's not the the hardest part. Uh, but maybe in the setting, you wake up in a you know black room and you need to find the lights first and open the doors. And I guess the true question, at the same as for the self driving cars, is will it be able to do it reliably? So in you know a thousand different apartments, um, what is the likelihood of of it like actually turning off? turning on the, the coffee maker and, and brewing coffee, right? Yeah. I guess doing it for, I don't know, 50% chance or like even like 10% chance, I think is not out of our range today, but doing it like reliably like a human would like every day, <laughs> uh, that's way more difficult. And yeah, so you mentioned a lot uh, Francois Follet um, and Yann Le Kuhn, who are French <laughs> and also uh, a bit of uh, contrarian to like the AGI takes. Um, I just want to go back to one of the things you said at the right at the real be beginning, uh, 
where for Yan Le Kun, there is no artificial general intelligence because yeah, it's impossible to uh, generalize completely to to any you know any input. Um, yeah, where where do you fall in you know those? Twitter persona like Cholet, maybe Gar- Gary Marcus or uh, Yann Lecun, and yeah, even uh, our, our previous guest, Ethan Cavallero, was more uh, bullish on AI progress. Where do you see yourself in this spectrum? Right. So if you want to think of the spectrum of positions on uh, the progress of AI as a, as a, as a one-dimensional spectrum, right? So you would have Ethan on one extreme or perhaps Nando de Freitas or like people this, people like that who think that scaling current architectures is all you need, what I call scaling maximalism. And then on the other end of the spectrum, you will have people like Gary Marcus, who um, is a pretty hardline skeptic about the capacities of current deep learning models. Perhaps Emily Bender would be somewhere in that region of the space as well. And somewhere in the middle, you'd have people like... Uh, Yann Lecun and Francois Cholet, and probably, as you suggested early on, the silent majority of deep learning researchers um, who think that current approaches have uh, enormous potential, but also some limitations, and that um, the way to move forward to get to something like human-level intelligence in artificial systems will require new concepts and not just scaling existing architectures. <laughs> and yeah, it so happens that Yann Lecun and Francis Chaudet are French, but it's not because they're French that I find their positions reasonable, but I do happen to uh, fall within that region of the space. So I, I, would, I would say that I, I align pretty well with um, the kind of positions that they've been advocating. In fact, it's, it's interesting because I was, I was recently, you know, rereading um, the stuff that, that Cholet wrote about the limitations of deep learning in his book, Deep Learning with Python, um, which really goes way beyond learning how to uh, uh, perform deep learning tasks with Python. He, he crammed a lot of theoretical stuff in that book too. But there is this section at the end about the limitations of deep learning. And, you know, this, I think, was written in 2019. So to be fair to him, you know, this was before some of the more recent developments. But if you read some of his stuff there, it sounds remarkably similar to some of the stuff that that Gary, Gary Marcus uh has been saying about, you know, uh, he's advocating for hybrid neurosymbolic architectures and saying that uh, deep learning is intrinsically, intrinsically limited in the range of things it can do because it's limited to interpolative problems. Um, and so I think in, on that spectrum, you probably would have Gary on one extreme and people like Nando de Freitas on Ethan and others on the other extreme. And then I would say probably that Francois Chaudet would be closer to Gary uh, than Yann Lecun. And Yann Lecun would be somewhere in further to the, to the right of that spectrum, if you think of this. Right. Yeah, uh, I brought up the French thing because we're two French people speaking in English about French researchers, <laughs> yes. and, and, and I thought it was funny. And yeah, about the Cholet versus Mark, Gary Marcus distinction, um, I think they're both maybe saying something similar that you know, deep learning has some limitations. But they're pointing at different solutions where actually has a focus on generalization. And um, yeah, you, you mentioned his paper on the measure of uh, yeah, how to measure intelligence with um, his new data, data set. And I think Gary Marcus is more focused on a uh, symbolic approach for AI. Yeah, although like I was surprised rereading that that section from the from Shelley's book that he he explicitly advocates for um, hybrid architectures, just just like Gary. So he he says that we'll need uh, what he calls algorithmic intelligence and geometric intelligence to work together. Where geometric intelligence is what you can get from deep learning, and arithmetic uh, sorry algorithmic intelligence is what you get from uh, symbolic uh, kind of good old fashioned style. AI systems. And he, he explicitly advocates, you know, he thinks the future is going to be integrating these two things, just like you can think of AlphaGo as a hybrid architecture in that sense, because it has this kind of, you know, Monte Carlo to research. And um, so he gives that example. But yeah, it's it's interesting. There is less daylight between Gary's view and, and Francois's view, as I felt there was. Uh, uh, probably the difference between them is in terms of their actual views is perhaps partially a matter of style. Uh, Gary has a more adversarial style, perhaps, than Francois. But um, yeah, it, it was interesting to me to, to see that. 
I think I think uh, Yann de Kuhn, for example, is more all in on uh, a kind of differentiable approach, gradient based approach to solving human level intelligence. So I think he's he's less convinced that you will need to plug in some kind of symbolic module. So you mentioned multiple times uh, scaling maximalism, and we, we've never defined it precisely. So can you maybe um, define this position or, or, or give the best Tillman of, of that position? Yeah, so uh, this is a, a little phrase I can on Twitter to refer to um, a position that I've seen popped up um, recently from a few people. Um, and perhaps the most succinct uh, expression of that of that uh, position would be through the slogan, scaling is all you need. So kind of paraphrasing on the attention is all you need paper and the various X is all you need papers that have been published since. Um, and so the idea is, is well, it's precisely it's, uh, the point of this Twitter thread that I, I made at the time was that it's kind of hard to pin down in specific detail what the claim is supposed to be. But um, intuitively, the idea is that um, the, we, we have observed since, you know, the days of uh, GPT-3 and the work of Jared Kaplan and others that there are the scaling laws with respect to the progress of transformer models such that if you scale um, the model size and the size of the training data, uh, you observe uh, proportionate uh, improvements uh, uh, of, the, of the loss. Uh, and you have this nice plot that you can make from there. We still haven't hit the limits of the scaling laws. So it seems that uh, even with the gargantuan models that we have today, like Palm with like 540 billion parameters, we still haven't hit the limits of the scaling laws. So there is this idea that's pretty reasonable that scaling is very effective. And furthermore, that through scaling model, model size and data size, you get these discontinuous improvements that had been observed already at the time of GPT-3 and have been observed again with Palm, that when you hit certain thresholds in terms of model size, um, you suddenly have this kind of nonlinear phase transition where the model suddenly gets much better at specific tasks. So uh, for example, arithmetic would be, or math-related tasks would be one example. So given these two observations, scaling lows and discontinuous improvements, people have started speculating about how much you can get for free, as it were, through raw, scale, raw scaling of existing architectures. Um, and there is this view that was once a fringe view is becoming more popular that we can get go all the way to human level intelligence just by scaling existing architecture and throwing more data and compute at it. Um, it's interesting because that was a view that someone like Gary Marcus and, you know, I, I disagree with Gary on many things, probably almost everything in some way. Uh, but uh, I also disagree with a lot of the people that um, have been attacking him or, or he's been disagreeing with. So again, I'm somewhere in the middle, but, uh, but, you know, one thing that I did notice, and I think he's right about this is that, People used to say he was attacking this kind of scaleless maximalist view. Uh, he's been attacking that for a while. And people used to say, well, that's a complete straw man. No one is actually defending that view. And uh, uh, recently, it's, it's become very clear that some people do hold that view, right? I mean, how literally they take it is an open question. Uh, and that's the thing about, you know, throwing out, like throwing around these sweeping slogans is that you can get away with saying, oh, I didn't mean it quite literally, you know, it's more of a general, you know, like aspiration, you know, it's not. Um, and there are a lot of memes going around as well. So like, you can always have this kind of uh, ironic take on all of this and say, well, you know, it was more of a joke. It was more of a meme. Uh, so, you know, it's hard to ascribe very specific commitments, theoretical commitments to uh, scaling maximalist, but that's the general idea. That's you can scale existing architectures, and that's all you need for uh, to get to something like AGI, if you want to use that term, or as I would prefer to put it, like something like human level intelligence and beyond. And I think when we mention scaling, there are a few things to consider. There's the scaling of compute, so you throw more flops at your and or you know, no more iterations at your system, then there's like scaling the size of your models. Um, and, and then there's maybe like some architectural tricks 
um, to make it work for you know different data um, or to scale more effectively, right? And when we say just scaling, um, we kind of sometimes dismiss those kind of tricks or, or things people need to consider to make it work. Um, gather more data, um, different type of data, uh, maybe multimodal that could transfer. Um, and I think you could say that scale is all you need is a meme that dismisses all, all those like tricks, but points at we, we will not need more innovation. We will not need um, completely different architecture. And maybe a transformer is, is possibly <laughs> what we need. Uh, and maybe those people only give you know a 50% chance of this being true. Uh, but but so far we, we haven't seen any thing any evidence that could, that would go the, like the opposite way. Right. Yeah, I think that's an important point. I mean, there are several things in what you just said. Um, one of them is actually going back to the scaling plots, so the scaling laws from Jared Kaplan and other people from OpenAI, um, and and not misinterpreting what they're really saying uh, because you know sometimes people throw these around um, and wildly extrapolate from them, um, ironically. But so what these plots are showing is that you get scaling lows. I think the original plot is like three plots showing scaling lows for three relationships. One is uh, model size plotted against uh, loss, um, the reduction of loss in the model. Um, another one was data, data set size plotted against the, the decrease in loss. and um, the third one was generally just compute versus decrease in loss. So you get, it seems like you get scaling lows for, um, you, you get improvements in measured in terms of, uh, uh, you know, decreased, decreased loss in the predictions of the, of the model when you increase, um, the model size, when you increase the data or more generally, when you throw more compute computational power at the model, which basically is a trade-off of data size and uh, and model size to vastly simplify. And more recently, the Chinchilla paper from DeepMind suggests that we've been underestimating how much, you know, the exact ratio that would be optimal for that, and maybe we need more data. But anyway, um, what's interesting for me is the other axis, uh, which is, you know, sometimes you hear people talking about scaling those as if it's plotting model size or data set size against intelligence, as if we had some kind of metric of uh, intelligence. But it's it's just measuring like autoregressive, you know, the, the loss of autoregressive models or the decrease in loss, right? So like uh, as they're predicting the next token. Um, and that's at best a proxy for some, perhaps slightly narrow in shortest sense, uh, sense of intelligence. Uh, we can't readily extrapolate from that to some kind of scaling low about something like human general intelligence. Um, so that's the first point I want to make. You know, we have to be careful that you know these these plots are specifically about uh, improvements in the predictions of autoregressive transformers. Um, and then there are the other things that you mentioned that uh, the the scaling maximalists tend to go quickly over things like changes to the architecture. And one, one point that I made in my thread on that was that uh, if you take the scaling is all you need view literally, it's, it's, it's literally false or absurd because even of the, the various recent models that have led people to lend more credence to that view, such as DALI2, Gato or Gato, uh, Palm, uh, Imagine and others, um, all of these required some at least minor architectural innovation or minor tweaks to existing architectures. So they, they did require some changes to the architecture. They're not just not scaling vanilla transformers uh, and seeing what happens. So that's one, one point. And then the other point you made is about um, the kind of data you feed to the model and how perhaps how you, how you format your data, what different modalities you include. Uh, how you serialize it, uh, how you feed it to the model, all of this matters a lot. And uh, 
uh, the ga- the Gato paper, for example, uh, shows some uh, innovation in that respect as well. There's some 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 innovative ways to serialize both discrete and continuous data. So button presses, uh, button presses, uh, uh, joint torques, text images in a way that is suitable to be fed to a transformer. So um, uh, all of this is also uh, kind of orthogonal to scaling. Um, and so, uh, yeah, if you take the scaling as a linear view, literally it's, it's full. So now if you want to be more charitable and uh, discuss some, perhaps a more plausible version of that view, there is something that we can get to human level intelligence with minor tweaks to existing architectures like transformer architectures. Uh, which is still a very strong view, and it's still a stronger view than something like uh, Richard Sutton's bitter lesson that gets thrown around a lot as a justification of scaling maximalism. And I think these two are different. So I think Richard Sutton said that most innovation would be in the scaling or like how to scale models and the tricks from researchers trying to get like a few percent increase in benchmarks from you know some mathematical tricks or small architectural changes we w- will be dismissed uh, after a few years and and what will count will be like the meta models the the models that will be able to generalize from you know more data and he was pretty you know, his argument was pretty close to saying scale um is all researchers actually need <laughs> and not like innovation. Um, so I, I, I disagree with that. I think, I think what Rich Sutton was saying, and, you know, uh, it's a short post on his website. So like, you know, like there is room for interpretation, but the way in which I read him is more saying something like, we don't need, as we once thought we did, to build in knowledge in our models. Uh, it will always be more effective in the long run to uh, learn from raw data and through bigger models the kind of knowledge we were tempting, tempted to build into them. And I think what he specifically refers to there is the kind of future engineering that um, was characteristic of earlier uh, machine learning models. So we don't need to handcraft uh, features for these models to learn from. We, we don't need to distill human knowledge in a way that needs to be hard coded in these models as priors, uh, we can learn a lot from raw data. Uh, I think in that respect, perhaps he would be more radical than certainly than someone like Gary Marcus, but also like someone like Francois Cholet, because even Francois Cholet is is um, adamant that we will need something like uh, what has been observed, hypothesized from the core knowledge literature in psychology. Uh, which is this idea that humans have innate priors with respect to things like, you know, uh, object persistence and, you know, spatial relations and things like that. Uh, this set of core knowledge, as they call it, um, is the work of Elizabeth Spelker, for example, from Harvard, um, that, you know, hu- non-human animals that display intelligent behaviors and humans have these innate priors, a uh, minimal set of innate priors. And so if you're someone like, Marcus of Francois Schuller, you might think we need to perhaps hard code some of these priors into models for them to have the generalization capacities of humans. And I think part of what Rich Sutton was suggesting is that perhaps we can have a more empiricist view, um, which I'm open to and rather sympathetic to, which is that you can leverage the power of computation to learn uh, some of this kind of human knowledge from raw data. But um, so that entails that um, all else being equal, we should favor the kind of architectural innovation that will scale more effectively uh, to learn better from from more data. Um, It doesn't entail that we don't need architectural innovation at all, right? It also doesn't entail that we need no inductive prior uh, no inductive bias of any kind. I mean, that's that's at the limit. That's just absurd because of the Noffrelange theorem and the induction problem. You can't just you know uh, learn anything if you don't have some kind of inductive bias. The real question is how much inductive bias and how much prior knowledge you need. That's also the crux of the disagreement between Gary and and Ian Kuhn.
to summarize your summary of, of Sudan Zoo, you're saying that you advocate for um, um, less features, human features in um, like um, less feature engineering in how we try to train our models and we you know, um, give more data to our models and they build the feature themselves um, and they're able to like meta learn tasks um, instead of um, having humans prepare them and the task over. Uh, is that a correct summarization? Yeah, basically, yeah, yeah. Um, and so I, I think it's a specific claim about skill is all you need is like skill is all you need, um, but like for uh, feature engineering or RL, and and then there there will be like other um, you know maybe skill is all you need is like a more general claim, and it, it applies to um, NLP and and other um, you know subfield of AI. I mean, the thing is, you know, if you think of it that way, then it becomes almost trivial because I don't think many people still think that you need hand-crafted feature engineering in deep learning. In fact, one of the main, um, you know, benefits of the move to deep learning be be beyond, beyond the kind of shallow machine learning algorithms we had before was uh, to learn features from data instead of uh, having handcrafted features, right? So, so you know, uh, at the limit, I feel like this this kind of characterization of the view kind of trivializes it. I would you know nuance it by saying in reinforcement learning, you want to train a model to play um, a specific games or a set of games or tasks, and the feature engineering I was referring to was mostly um, maybe like hyper hyper parameter search and and try to like change your algorithm that to fit a certain environment so that your model would like learn how to play a certain game. And if you're able to have something that plays like a bunch of different games and like meta learns how to learn games, um, then you wouldn't need to like change your app parameters or like change your training algorithm. It will just like be able to, um, you know, <laughs> learn effectively by himself because you've seen a bunch of different things. So yeah, I think that's a better description, uh, probably. And that, that doesn't entail that, you know, you can do this only through scaling. Uh, if you want to think of a broader range of tasks than just, you know, playing Atari games, right? So again, it's agnostic. I feel like it's, it's related to the scaling issue because scaling is part of the equation. Definitely, I think few people would debate, dis dispute that, but at most, it entails that scaling is a necessary condition for more general forms of intelligence, not that scaling is a sufficient condition. Right. So meta learning is in practice more useful than you know research tricks from the 2010s or 2000s. I think that's what he meant. Right. Because we're, we've talked about some thought experiments and you're a philosopher, I want to ask you this question. Imagine Raphael Miliar uh, from 2025 is now convinced that scale is all you need, or maybe like a, a more, um, you know, a, a weaker version. And he, he comes right now and he says, Hey, Raphael, uh, this is, this is what happened. Uh, now I'm convinced <laughs> what would be likely, uh, what's something likely that he would tell you. So in other words, what could convince me that scale is all you need? Um, well, um, so again, part of the issue here is is that we need to have a precise definition of the claim in order to for it to be uh, uh, falsifiable, right? Uh, uh, or you know, corroborated by by evidence. So, I mean, really, the thing that you know, uh, the obvious thing that could convince someone that scaling existing architectures is all you need is if. Uh, we get to something that looks like general human level intelligence just by scaling out using architecture. So that, you know, like, like, you know, trivially, if we get there, if we have a system that can do all of the things that humans, humans can do and pass uh, various tests, including the coffee test, uh, full self-driving, uh, all forms of harder, difficult tests, uh, then, uh, then, uh, I would have to agree that scaling uh, was all you need, uh, all we needed all along. 
uh, if the architecture is not substantive, substantively different from the architectures we have today. But I, I, I guess your question perhaps would be more like um, what might at least you know, lead me to, re to, to, to revise my credence in the claim that scaling is not all you need and perhaps you know, that think that we might get there by scaling existing architectures. Um, I think if you show, if Raphael from the future showed me that um, something that's basically similar to current transformers um, can reach human level at some of the hardest benchmarks we have today, such as uh, Sholay's ARC, ARC challenge, uh, all of the big bench tasks, uh, things like the Rina Ground benchmark that came out recently about like compositionality in vision language models. Um, if you can do all of this with uh, just by having massive models with uh, minimal uh, changes to the architecture, that would give me pause, certainly. Um, um, yeah, I mean, yeah, I think that would give me pause and perhaps, you know, lead me to have more faith in emergent features of transformer models um, at scale. But I think, you know, one of the, I mean, I, I do think the transformer architecture is, a, is an extraordinarily powerful architecture. And I, and I think a lot of people are, are short selling what transformers can do, but part of the limitation of the current approach for me is um, the way in which we, 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 we training model completely passively by just uh, having, you know, a training phase that consists, consists in ingurgitating massive amounts of data uh, with a very, very simple learning function, learning objective, like just predicting the next token or the next time step or something like that. And then, uh, you know, having a frozen model that just is tested on a bunch of downstream tasks. Uh, this is so different from learning that we observe from biological agent that it seems very unlikely to me that this kind of approach can lead to the same degree of generalization to what sure they would call extreme generalization. So, so I, I think we there's like a different ways uh, a model could learn. Um, what was happening uh, better and better in the early 2010s was supervised learning. We, we got like from good to like almost perfect um, classification of ImageNet um, by just having deeper models. And so that's like, you label a bunch of data and then you feed it to your model and people were disagreeing like, oh, a baby can just like see a couple of examples and doesn't need like a million labeled images to know what's a cat or a dog. And then right now, I think that's something Ilya um, from OpenAI said recently is that it's crazy that now unsupervised learning just works and wasn't working for like decades. And now it just works like for no reason at all. And, and people are unsurprised. They're just like, oh yeah, it works. Um, and you're just like able to train your model on, you know, billions of tokens. And um, that's crazier than what was happening before. Now you're not like labeling everything. You just have the fact that we have something that can just like predict the next token and, you know, have good performance on a bunch of error task or uh, Jupyter 3 downstream task, arithmetic, and a bunch of different things. It's, it's, it's crazy in itself, right? Yes. What you're saying is that's not what humans, that's not how humans learn, right? But this is still uh, thinking about only unsupervised learning and or supervised learning. But then there's like reinforcement learning that is like closer to what humans do. And there's like a massive progress in RL and people are showing that you can mix all those different learnings to get something even better, right? So, um, I think when we're just saying that, you know, um, we give it a bunch of examples or, in, or just like predicting the next token is not like what humans do. It's kind of dismissing um, what we could do in the future or like what, we're, what is actually happening in IRL research. Yeah, I mean, I agree with all, all everything you said, basically. I mean, I, I think um, the, the recent success of, I mean, nowadays 
it's fashionable not to call it unsupervised, but self-supervised instead. Oh, sorry. <laughs> because, which is interesting, I think it's just, uh, it's, it's a matter of semantics, but like, it's still interesting that um, um, there is a sense in which calling the kind of learning that large foundation models or language models do unsupervised, that is slightly misleading. Um, because, you know, like, uh, at the end of the day, whether it's a masked language model like BERT or an autoregressive model like GP3, you're really, um, um, you know, giving, uh, uh, creating like, uh, these, these masks, whether you're masking the next word or a word in the sentence, uh, so, uh, uh, you know, artificially creating this, this, uh, this, uh, learning samples and then giving a, uh, giving a signal in the form of, of the, the last right to just models and so on. And which is again, like, um, not quite how humans, uh, learn things like, uh, you know, the meaning of us. So maybe there is, there is, um, in other words, there is, we haven't yet reached the most unsupervised forms of learning that humans are capable of. So perhaps the self-supervised versus unsupervised distinction is helpful to keep in mind in our respect. Um, that being said, I mean, I agree that it's tremendous what model, these models can do. And I agree that it's very exciting what uh, we've been seeing from the RL side of things as well. Uh, I'm not convinced yet that we can bridge these two things seamlessly um, in ways that are that we can just scale to um, human-like generalization. So there is a lot of work on decision transformers uh, to do some kind of offline reinforcement learning. Um, what I've read so far suggests that these models actually struggle to generalize appropriately. Uh, I, in fact, there is a, a paper that just came out. Uh, I was reading this like yesterday, I think, uh, precisely about this, that offline reinforcement learning of the kind that we find in decision transformers um, is 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 very limited uh by uh the fact that it's that it's that it's learning completely passively from data right so two things that that humans and animals do that most machine learning models don't do is one active learning i mean this is something that our models can do so sampling the world to you know ge like generating your own learning samples by actively sampling the world um and secondly, lifelong learning, uh, which is an active area of research in deep learning, but um, still today, like basically uh, virtually every model is trained first and then deployed as a kind of frozen model. Um, so, um, you know, I don't think, um, maybe I'm wrong, but my intuition is that we're not going to um, the, 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 the innovation required to incorporate things like active online learning and lifelong learning into um, current transformer style architectures is not going to be just a matter of like minor tweaks. Uh, um, it will be more substantive than that. And perhaps it will require, probably might, it will require moving beyond transformer architecture or having, you know, attention be just a more minor, minor part of the, the whole architecture. What do you mean by continual learning? Lifelong? Well, just the ability to uh, update the weights of the model uh, uh, continuously as you deploy the model, right? So currently you, you train the model once um, and then you can fine tune it if you want to further change the weights, but you have a, you have a training event or a number of continual like, um, sequential training events, if you want to think of it that way. And then at some point you stop training, you, you freeze the weights and you just uh, test the model on downstream tasks. And that's basically the way all of deep learning works. But that's not how humans or animals work. We keep constantly the, you know, the, the synaptic weights in the brain are being adjusted and we constantly learn from new experiences. You would want something that is connected to a real world stream of data and update its ways in, re in real time after each example. And the, the only, the only learning part is, um, instead of learning in an offline uh, fashion, it's, it's trained by, you know, um, 
being directly accessing uh, a stream of real-time data. Yeah, and not just accessing a stream of data, but sampling data from the world, right? Or sampling information from the world, which is <clears throat> becomes quite important when you start thinking about things like causal inference and and this kind of thing. So in, inter intervention in the world uh, becomes becomes quite quite significant to move beyond correlations uh, in the way you learn from data. So you've talked a bunch about the different benchmarks that would convince uh, you today, um, that scale is all you need, um, is a thing. And you started with, you know, things that are kind of too difficult, which is, um, of course, if you achieve AGI, then, uh, you, you would have been convinced, <laughs> uh, after seeing the evidence. And when you say full self driving for, to me, um, full self driving is some, in some sense, AI complete or AGI complete, like you would, you would need to. Have yeah, AGI okay. to achieve full self driving, but okay, I get you. Um, I think people from the scale is all you need camp, or um, were very bullish on on AI, uh, would tell you is that um, the goalposts have moved, um, and if if I were to interview you maybe like five years ago, um, you might have maybe not you, but like someone else might have mm -hmm. been very impressed by where we are today. But right now we need like another level um, to be impressed. I think there was a meme, um, sorry, a tweet by Miles Brundage from OpenAI, uh, who was saying like AI researchers from 2025 be like, oh, uh, this model can generate an entire movie, but the plot is pretty bad and uh, the actor is not uh, really convincing. So, <laughs> so right now we have you know um, models that can create realistic images with Dolly and and Imogen. And people are like criticizing specific parts about the, um, you know, compositionality or, um, you know, human faces or, or a bunch of different things. Um, but we were never going to be fully, uh, you know, impressed because things are, are kind of moving in a continuum. Um, so yeah, well, how do you feel about this whole like goalpost moving in the, in the field of AI? I mean, I have a, a bunch of things to say about this. Um, <clears throat> the first thing I would say is that. You, it's perfectly consistent to be impressed by what something is doing and yet uh, cogently discuss the remaining limitations of that thing, right? Uh, otherwise, we'd just be like, oh, okay, pack it up, guys. Like, uh, we've had DALI 2. That's all we need. There is no further improvement we can, we can obtain in AI research. Uh, this is the pinnacle of artificial intelligence. No one is saying this. So like, you know, like, come on, like... Uh, if we want progress, uh, the, 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 the basic first step is to lucidly evaluate the limitations of current systems. And I think people do, I, I get it, people do get sometimes annoyed with people like Gary Marcus on Twitter because he's a bit of like the gadfly of deep learning constantly, you know, um, uh, pointing out the limitations rather than the successes. And I, 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 I do partly agree with that, that, you know, sometimes... Um, I think we have to be fair, and I'm personally very impressed by deep learning models. I've consistently been impressed ever since I got interested in deep learning, uh, and I'm not one to minimize the successes of deep learning. In fact, I routinely, uh, on Twitter, for example, when I engage, uh, uh, you know, uh, show some examples of successes. I've done this with compositionality, for example. So, uh, I think uh, we ought to be impressed by what deep learning can do. And no one, I think, very few people at least could have predicted how far we could go with current approaches. So that's, I think that's absolutely true. Uh, that doesn't mean we should uh, just stop being, uh, you know, like, like turn off any critical thinking and, and think that, uh, like, you know, massively anthropomorphize what current models are doing and think, you know, that DALI 2 is as intelligent as a human being. Um, so then we have to uh, stop for a second and try to carefully, meticulously, and systematically assess current uh, capacities of models and remaining limitations. That being said, I do agree that goalpost moving is, is uh, regrettable and unhelpful. I think AI skeptics have been doing it for a long time. It's, it's, it's become a joke at this point, but, you know, uh, early... Uh, 
AI pioneers used to say, when we beat chess is when we have artificial intelligence systems. And then once chess was solved, people have been saying, well, chess is not really the measure of intelligence. And this has been happening over and over and over again. Um, I would say, though, you know, um, my personal view on this is that we are making progress towards more general intelligence. And I like to think of this as in, in this more relativistic or relational terms. We are increasing the generality of the generalization capacities of models. We've been talking about this in this very podcast a, a, a while back. Um, but we haven't yet reached the the kind of extreme generalization that humans are capable of. And these two things are very consistent with one another, right? So we are making models that by some metrics could be considered more intelligent or by some metrics could be considered to have a more general intelligence. And yet there are still remaining hurdles to get to the kind of general intelligence that humans have. Uh, so that's, that's different from moving the goalposts. That's just saying the goalpost, the ultimate goalpost remains the same, something like an intelligence, an artificial intelligence that has the same extreme generalization capacities as humans. Uh, and we keep getting close to that, but we're not there yet. And the, well, a couple other things I wanted to say about this is that um, something that sometimes people fail to observe is that there is some goalposts moving in the other camp from the more the other extreme side, right? Which is, um, if you're a scaling maximalist, uh, I suspect we're going to see more and more of that, where you say scaling is all you need, and then there's a new model that comes out that achieves some breakthrough through some modification of the architecture and the scaling maximalists are going to say, oh, but that's evident that scaling is all you need. Uh, and, you know, yes, there are some modification of the architecture, but that doesn't really count, right? It's basically the same architecture. And so then a the question is like, how much architectural innovation um, will scaling maximalists allow before they acknowledge that this, you know, this is not just a matter of scaling, but also a matter of changing the architecture or the format of the data or various other things aside from scaling, right? So I suspect we're going to see a lot of goalposts moving f from that side too. And I think we should be, we should avoid goalposts moving in both, in both directions. Um, and the final thing I wanted to say is that this whole discussion reminds me of, we touched on this earlier, but um, I do worry a little bit about polarization in, in the discussion of these issues, especially on social media. And I had this exchange about this recently uh, with Chris Ola, who seems to worry about similar things. Um, again, like the vocal minorities uh, that are more liable to go post moving are of the ones that perhaps occupy uh, the most space on social media. But um, I think there are tons of people who try to do careful evaluations of current models acknowledging strengths, but also trying to evaluate remaining limitations. And, you know, this is uh, the kind of work we should be doing. Um, it's, it's, it's not very helpful to either, uh, you know, loudly uh, say that uh, models are not intelligent yet, or that uh, models are basically uh, like scanning existing architecture will is is basically getting us in the not even near term to 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 human intelligence. I think um, if we take a step back for a second and just carefully evaluate the strengths and limitations of the models, we can we can make more specific falsifiable claims that are less susceptible to be affected by goalpost moving. If that makes sense. Hopefully, hopefully we can avoid goalpost moving in in, in both camps. You started using the word should, which is um, a very specific word for a philosopher, um, where I think that's where we disagree because, and, and, and that reflects in, in, you know, what we say is about the world, um, because I think people concerned with um, existential risk from AI are looking at AI progress and thinking about what could happen if something is true or not. So if scale is indeed all you need, then maybe there's like a, with a 10% chance, there's a 10% chance that in five or 10 years, um, we would get something close to AGI, 
and maybe then we can think of like what would be the impact in the world and um if if we come back to the out question um should we prepare for those risks right now considering there's like a 10% chance of something dramatic happening in 10 years and maybe what the ai skeptics are saying is they're probably more in the camp of like ai is so difficult that um we we're, we're trying to make progress and and all those like ai researchers are in the same like camp of trying to make progress on on this hard task and when they propose a paper they they're trying to make progress and what gary or other skeptics are doing is maybe um bringing more nuance and saying like oh cool your your results are pretty good but you're not really like generalizing to this and um but the, the goal is always like make progress in ai and 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 when you see this you're like okay cool so you're being useful because you're like pointing at limitations and then we can we're going to be like make more useful progress the the other i guess um i think there's like a another camp which who are maybe like the singularists or the agi cult i will say who think that it's it's going to be good or there's like a high chance of of it like being very good for the world and um low risk or maybe they dismiss the risk um and this camp is very bullish on ai and we'll see everything as like oh yeah uh, we're going to to get closer to something very good for humanity um and yeah i think gary is is maybe like um skeptic of this view or or like the, um thinks the thing is very far away so i think there's like a bunch of different um criteria and people talking about it and I, at least like on my part when i think about current progress i think about you know if if this is true and scale is all you need what would it mean for humanity and like should we prepare for it or not um i'm i'm not like um doing motivated reasoning of like i want this thing to happen um i i don't want to reach agi too soon um for for me and i guess another thing you were saying is about social media and like people talking past each other uh and a silent majority of people not saying anything and you were saying that your takes were not very controversial and that there was like a silent majority of people thinking the same things as as you do or or something close and there's also something close related to existential risk from ai where if you're like an existing ai researcher at some prestigious lab or university um you cannot really talk about existential risk because it's somehow um out of the overton window for ai researchers and to me there's also like a silence uh, part of the researchers that are concerned about agi or are concerned about existential risk but cannot really talk about it out loud because otherwise they would lose their job and um it is starting to like open more and more and people are talking about it more and more because they're more impressed right but i i i think there's like a silent majority in 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 both camps right i mean you know i think if you're really concerned about uh existential risk from the development of ai and you believe in something like scaling maximalism then you probably shouldn't be working for one of the labs that's trying to bring uh um human level or superhuman level into artificial intelligence right so you have to be consistent and put your your uh, actions where your mouth is um so if really there is this silent majority of ai researchers in various labs around the world who are like uh kept up at night by existential risk uh and also think that we can get to that level of risk by scaling existing architectures and yet in their day jobs are working on scaling existing architectures more efficiently that seems to be like a, a bit of a disconnect so it's it's not always that simple right so we 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 both agree that i guess that there's like some you know risk of um catastrophe from climate change in in the decades um that are coming right but we're, we're not actively working on those because we don't have like a you know um omnipotence on like the outcomes and i think so some people so, so i think some people see agi as climate change probably as something that could impact their future in um different degrees and they might not have a huge impact on this 
and they're just like singing from outside. And as an egoistic point of view, they're just like, oh, where am I going to risk my job and my reputation if it's only, it's only going to like change by, I don't know, 0. 0.0001% uh, the outcome. So, and, and also like those, those teams, so they're like a bunch of different labs working on instant risk. So those people um, that are not expressing themselves on social media, they might also have like jobs that are not, at, you know, um, Baidu or, or Microsoft or, 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 or those things, but like at actual like labs working on exit risk. And, and those labs working on AGI, so maybe like OpenAI or DeepMind also have like safety teams or like alignment teams. Um, so it's, it's not like, um, I don't know, a clear separation between like capabilities and safety or um, it, it's much more nuanced than that. That's true, but I don't think your analogy is quite works quite in the way you want it to work because it's not like uh, you know there's a difference between um, having a regular job that is not uh, you know worrying about the environmental collapse and having a regular job and not quitting everything you're doing to uh, uh, work um, on um, for example renewable energies, and on the other hand having these worries about uh, impending climate collapse and working for ExxonMobil. Uh, now, if you do think that um, uh, existential risks are real and that we could get there by scaling ex existing architectures and you explicitly work in your day job on scaling existing architectures, that seems to me like, you know, even if, you were, if, you, if, you're, cons if you're trying to work on things like alignment, you know, like uh, if you really do believe that, and I'm not saying that I personally do, because again, I'm not a scaling maximalist and I also have some, uh, you know, uh, qualms about how the debates on existential risk is framed. But um, if you do believe these two things, uh, then it seems like, you know, instead of working on alignment, a better thing to do would be to try to work to, to, to militate against the, the scaling these models at all, right? So just to, uh, instead of actively supporting uh, scaling efforts. Uh, that's just an observation. You're pointing at activism, so there there could be um, more effective ways or things that people are not doing, which is strong activism against <laughs> scaling or or AGI. And I think those are those things are 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 being brought up more and more. But it's it's not the best way to you know bring this issue to AI researchers. Um, I think if 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 you want to actually push the field of, you know, AI element forward, you want to bring good research to the world and, and show that those people are not like crackpots from the 2000s thinking about something um, very far-fetched, but they're actually like knowledgeable researchers trying to make progress and things. Um, so activism is being brought up, but it's not the main concern at, at the time. And so to, to just answer your concern about uh, those people working on scaling, you know, that there's a... Um, Again, a continuum between, um, you know, training big models, training large models, and being the one, being Jared Kaplan, publishing like uh, the scaling loss paper at OpenAI. So there are like various ways to work on this, and working on AI makes you a better researcher that could possibly align the things. So like instrumentally, even if you do um, some research that pushes the AI field forward for ten years. And after 10 years, you like do some like five papers on alignment, like the fraction of, of the research you do in the first 10 years is, is so minimal compared to like the other millions of researchers doing things is that, that your impact is very minimal. But at the end, there are like so few people doing alignment that like being a, um, you know, an expert in this on in AI, um, you know, will make a, con you know, a significant impact in the overall research, right? So if there are like a hundred researchers doing alignment and you're one of them, you're doing a, a huge impact and learning things early on um, requires you to like interact with AI. And, and, and the way to go is, you know, work at Google for, you know, do a PhD at Stanford or, or those things um, because otherwise you wouldn't just be someone writing about <laughs> far-fetched topics without any AI understanding. Maybe, maybe, but again, it's like, and, and I'm not, again, I'm not saying that I, that I, I personally believe these things, but if you do have a very real concern for existential risk and is a scaling maximalist, uh, 
and you have that kind of outlook, it's a little bit like, uh, you know, if you were like in the 1940s working on, on, on nuclear weapons and saying, well, it's, it's okay because at the end of the road, once I've contributed to the effort to develop nuclear weapons, I will write a, a treaty on, on uh, international uh, nuclear policy and, uh, and, you know, how to avoid nuclear war, right? So um, maybe you will make a tremendous contribution that way to avoid nuclear war, but there is still a valid question about why you're working to develop that very thing in the first place if you really are worried about existential risk. It's kind of a cost-benefit analysis. If you really think the outcome that's even, you know, uh, remotely plausible is that the whole of humanity gets wiped out, um, why uh, would you actively uh, contribute to scaling it first if you think that's one road to that kind of outcome? But, you know, I mean, I personally, I'm, I'm not that worried about existential risk uh, comparatively to some other issues, but you know, I also think it's not either or. We can, there's plenty of, of space uh, to worry about different things concurrently. Um, so I'm not saying that I, I subscribe to that view, but I'm just you know, trying to place myself in the shoes of someone who does. Right, and I think for your example on nuclear war or nuclear risk, uh, for the Manhattan Project, there were probably hundreds of researchers um, in the U.S. working on this, maybe some, same amount in Germany. Um, and, and they didn't really know that, they, that, that the thing would succeed. I think they were just like trying. And, um, and, they were, and it was very unclear for them, like, how long would it take? And for the people who um, actually did nuclear fission for the first time, um, I think they were quite surprised. And yeah, in, 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 for AI, I think the, the scale is just so different that instead of being like one in a hundred, you might be like one in a million. So your, your impact is much less, right. As, as an individual. Um, yeah, I mean, you can say something about recycling and things like that, of course, but you know, your impact as an individual is, is, you know, very small on climate change, uh, you know, taking planes, uh, recycling, having children, whatever you you want to talk about like your impact as an individual is is a drop in the bucket. Uh, does it mean that it doesn't have implications about uh, what you ought to do if you do have certain beliefs, right? So uh, again, I'm just th thinking it's a it's it's kind of uh, a counterfactual argument, right? But if it, well, or at least like um, uh, making some assumptions about existential risk being a real concern and it being um, precipitated by scaling alone. Um, but if you talk about nuclear weapons, like a lot of scientists also refused uh, to contribute to that effort. And so if that's a genuine concern, that's something that's worth bringing to the table. Yeah, to, to, to just go back to something you said before about compositionality and um, the things you've been reacting to more recently on DALI and Imogen. Could you maybe like define what's compos compositionality for philosophers or maybe like in the context of imagination? Yeah, so um, that's something I'm, cu I'm currently very interested in in my own work. So um, compositionality was initially defined as a property of language. Uh, you can define it as a property of formal languages. Uh, and although it, it, it's more controversial for natural language, um, but the idea is that in a compositional system, the meaning of a complex expression is fully determined by the meaning of its constituent parts plus its syntactic structure, so the way in which these parts are composed with one another. Um, so, you know, you can think of uh, a complex expression in, in uh, uh, first order logic, for example, or you can think indeed of an example with natural language sentence like the cat is on the mat, the meaning of that sentence is determined by the meaning of its constituent parts. So the meaning of the cat, the meaning of mat, the meaning of uh, the verb is, and how they're combined syntactically uh, with an agent and a patient, or like at least like a, a subject of the verb and a, and a complement, and the way in which this, this meaning, um, um, you know, the meaning of the whole sentence is, is determined through that syntactic structure and, and the, the meaning of the parts. So that's compositionality in the linguistic domain. Now, there are reasons to think that natural language might not be fully or strictly compositional in the sense that 
the meaning of sentences in natural language can be determined by some factors other than the meaning of constituent parts and uh, syntactic structures, so things like the context of occurrence, uh, you know, various pragmatic considerations and so on. But, you know, a weaker claim would be that um, the meaning of at least some sentences uh, and the meaning of most sentences is at least partially determined by the meaning of constituent parts and syntactic structures. So if you want to understand language, if you want to understand the meaning of sentences properly, you need to have a grasp on the meaning of words, lexical semantics, and you need to have a grasp on how these meanings combine together to form complex expressions, which is what we call compositional semantics. So that's for language. And then you can, um, by analogy, um, talk about um, compositionality in non-linguistic uh, representational systems, including uh, in the visual domain. So something that would be rather close to the notion of compositionality that's uh, used for language would be uh, the compositionality of symbols for things like road signs. So you can think of individual elements like arrows and uh, uh, various other individual elements of road signs that can be recombined with each other such that the meaning of the combinations in word signs is determined by how these symbols are combined together and the meaning of individual symbols. Um, now, when it comes to natural images, like an image, a picture of a cat, things are a little bit more fuzzy and uh, the way in which you can think of compositional semantics there is a little bit more uh, abstracted away from the linguistic context because uh, there the notion of structure in an image is different from syntactic structure in language. Uh, and also the notion of meaning is harder to apply literally. So, you know, what's the meaning of a pixel or what's the meaning of an edge, you know, that, that uh, gets a little bit more complicated. But still, there is a broad notion of composition there. And you can think of understanding what an image means or what a video means in compositional terms by segmenting the image into constituent parts and understanding how these parts are composed and interacting with each other. Um, so when people talk about compositionality when it comes to AI, I think um, what they're mostly concerned with is a parsing problem. How can we build a system that can parse language or images or videos or whatever other domain that might be compositional in a way that is suitably sensitive to the compositional structure of the input and produce outputs that are appropriately sensitive to the compositional structure of the input. So if you think of this in a in a text-to-text -text domain like uh, text generation for an autoregressive model. You can think of an example where you have um, some sequence of text like uh, man bites dog, and then a question, uh, who needs urgent care? And you prompt the model to give an answer. If the model just uses the statistics, uh, the distributional statistics of words, it might be prone to responding the man because usually what gets bitten in that context when you have a man and a dog involved is, this is an old example for Steve Pinker, from Steve Pinker uh, is it's the man, right? Uh, however, if the model really grasps the compositional semantics of the input, then it will say the dog. Um, if you think of this in the text to image generation, uh, uh, then you can think of all the examples that I've been discussing on Twitter and others have as well, like Gary Marcus. So a failure case would be uh, generating an image for the caption uh, uh, a, a horse riding on an astronaut. That was the example that Gary Marcus talked about um, where uh, a human would be able to draw that because a human understands the compositional semantics of that input uh, and current models are, are struggling also because of, of um, distributional statistics. Um, and in the image to text example, that would be, for example, uh, stuff that we've been seeing with uh, Flamingo from DeepMind where you look at an image and that might represent something very unusual and uh, you're unable to correctly describe the image uh, in, in the way that's uh, you know, aligned with the composition of the image. So that's the parsing problem that I think people are mostly concerned with when it comes to compositionality and AI. I think there is a further question that's about, that's about the kind of representations that the systems themselves have and whether they have represent, structured representations that are compositional, such that uh, the representation of a complex 
expression is itself made of the combination of the representations of its constituent parts. So Jerry Fodor, who talked about a lot about compositionality, thought that in order for humans to parse compositional semantics in language, we need to have a language of thought. So we need, we need mental representations that themselves have compositional structure. Uh, and you might make a similar argument for language models or AI models generally, if you're convinced by this kind of argument, uh, saying something like, if you want a model to solve the parsing problem, to really be able to parse compositional, compositionally structured inputs in a, sense, in, in, in a reasonable way, uh, you want this model to have representations that can be recombinable where uh, simple representations can enter as constituents into complex representations with some kind of syntactic structure, essentially implementing something like a classical symbolic architecture. Um, and so I think Gary has some sympathy for that kind of view, at least in the, in the realm of hybrid models where you need some kind of symbolic component that has this kind of feature. Uh, and some people think that you might be able to get away with a fully differentiable architecture that doesn't literally have this kind of property. Yeah, so just to be more practical, um, the examples you gave was of a horse riding an astronaut. That's something uh, Dali or Imogen was not able to, of, of doing. What were like other examples of the limitations um, in, in, in practice? Like what are the images that you were not able to represent? Yeah, so um, the thing about compositionality that um, I think is often underappreciated in these discussions is that um, a complex expression can have more or less compositional structure or syntactic structure, right? So you have some examples of combinations or compositional, or like, you know, complex expressions where you have a minimum amount of syntactic structure. So for example, conceptual combinations, which is just put two concepts together. If I talk to you about the concept of, uh, to take an example that's popular with image generation, an avocado chair, right? There is minimal syntactic structure there. You're just literally putting together two nouns and combining them as a single concept. Um, so that doesn't require you to abstract a lot about the syntactic structure of the sentence. Uh, there is no verb. Uh, it's just some kind of conceptual blending. And current text to image generation models are very good at that. Um, the avocado chair example uh, rose to prominence with Dali, the first one. Um, and I just posted some examples on Twitter of uh, hybrid animals uh, testing Dali 2 on combining two different, uh, very different animals together, like uh, a hippopotamus octopus or things like that. And it's very good at combining these concepts together and doing so even in a way that demonstrates some minimal comprehension of uh, world knowledge uh, in the sense that it combines the concept, not just by kind of like haphazardly throwing together features of a hypopotamus and features of, of, a, of an octopus or features of a chair or an avocado, but combining them in a plausible way that's consistent with how a chair looks and would behave in the real world or uh, things like that. So that's examples that are mostly semantic composition because it's mostly about the semantic content of each concept combined together with minimal syntactic structure. The realm in which current image to generation, uh, text to image generation models seem to struggle more right now is with respect to compositional um, uh, examples of compositionality that have a more sophisticated syntactic structure. So one uh, good example from the DALI 2 paper is prompting a model to generate a red cube on top of a blue cube. Um, what that um, um, example introduces compared to the conceptual blending examples I've given is what people call in psychology variable binding. So you need to bind uh, the property of being blue to a cube that's on top and the property of being red to a cube that's, I think I gave it the other way around. So uh, red to the cube that's on top and blue to the cube that's at the bottom. Um, and a model like DALI2 is not well suited for that kind of thing. And that's, we could talk about this, but that's also an artifact of its architecture because it's, it's, it's uses, it leverages uh, the text encodings of CLIP, 
which is trained by contrastive learning. And so uh, when it's training clips, um, is only trying to uh, maximize the distance between uh, in, uh, text Im image pairs that are uh, not matching and minimize the distance between uh, text image pairs that are matching where the, the, the text is the right caption for the image. And so during that, through that constructive learning procedure, it's only keeping um, information about the text that is useful for this kind of task. So it's it's kind of, uh, a lot of this can be done without model, modeling closely the syntactic structure of the prompts or the captions um, because and, you know, unless we advers adversarially designed a new data set for clip that would uh, include a lot of unusual compositional examples like a horse riding an astronaut and various examples of blue cubes and red cubes on top of one another. And so if you, given the kind of training data that clip has, especially for Dali 2, it's like stock photo images and stuff like that, you don't really need to represent rich compositional information like that to train clip and hence the limitations of of DALI 2. Imagine does better at this because it uses a frozen language model, uh, T5XL, I think, which, um, you know, we know that language models do capture rich compositional uh, information. Do you know how it uses the language model? I haven't done a deep dive into the imaging paper yet, but it's, it's using a frozen uh, T5 model uh, to encode the prompts, and then uh, it has some kind of other component that translate these prompts into uh, uh, into image embeddings, and then does some like graduate upscaling. Um, so there is some kind of diffusion model that uh, multimodal diffusion model that takes the T five embedding and is trained uh, to translate that into image embedding space. But I, I, I couldn't, I don't exactly remember how it does that. But I think the key part here is that the initial text embedding is not the result of contrasting learning, unlike the clip model that's used for DALI. Gotcha. Yeah, I agree that, um, yeah, from the images you have in line, you don't have a bunch of, you know, a red cube on, on top of a blue, on top of a, of a green one. And it's easy to find, you know, counterexamples that are very far from the training distribution. Um, I'm curious about your experience with Dolly because you've been talking about Dolly before you had access, and I think in the recent weeks um, you've gained the API access. So have you um, updated on how good it is or um, AI progress in general, just from you know playing playing with it and being able to like see the results from you know uh, Octopus? Uh, I don't know how, to, how you call it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, to be honest, I, I think I had a fairly good idea of what Dali could and couldn't do before I got access to it. And uh, there's nothing that I generated that kind of like made me massively update that uh, prior uh, I had. So again, it's very good at um, concept, simple conceptual combination. Uh, <clears throat> it can also do fairly well some simple forms of more syntactically structured um, composition. So, um, if you ask it for like, I don't know, like, uh, uh, one prompt that I tested it on, that was quite, quite funny is that an, an angry Parisian holding a baguette. Um, so, you know, an, an angry Parisian holding a baguette, digital art, uh, basically every output is spot on. So it's like, um, a picture of an angry man, uh, with a beret, uh, holding a baguette. Right. So, uh, this kind of simple compositional structure is doing really well at it. That's already very impressive in my book. So, you know, that's, I, I was pushing back initially against some of the claims from Gary Marcus precisely on that, you know, where, around the time of the whole deep learning is hitting a wall stuff. Um, he was emphasizing that deep learning, as he would put it, fails at compositionality. I think, first of all, that's a vague claim because there are various things that could mean, depending on how you understand compositionality. Um, and what I pointed out in my reaction to that is that really at m what the claim that is actually warranted by the evidence is that there are failure cases um, with current deep learning model, with all current deep learning models at parsing compositionally structured inputs. So there are cases in which they fail, that's true, especially the very convoluted examples that Gary has been testing DALI 2 on, like 
a blue tube on top of a red pyramid on top of the next to a green uh, triangle or whatever you know uh when you get to a certain level of complexity, even humans struggle, you know, like if, if I ask you to draw that and I just like, I didn't repeat the prompt, I just gave it to you like once, uh, you probably would make mistakes. Um, the difference is that uh, um, we humans can go back and look at the prompt and break it down into subcomponents, And that's actually something I'm, I'm very um, curious about, I think it like a, a low hanging fruit for research on these models would be to do something a little similar to chain of thought prompting, but with text to image models instead of just language models. So, you know, with text chain of thought prompting of a scratch, scratch, pad, scratch pad paper with language models, you see that you can get remarkable improvements uh, uh, at um, in context learning when you uh, in your few shot examples, you give examples of breaking down the problem into sub sub steps, you know? Let's think about this problem step by step. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so, well, actually the let's think about this step by step stuff was slightly debunked in my view by just uh, by um, a blog post that just came out. Uh, who, who did that? Uh, I think uh, someone from MIT. Um, I could see the link, but like someone who tried a different, a whole bunch of different uh, tricks for prompt engineering and found that at least with arithmetic, the, 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 the only really efficient one is to do careful chain of thought prompting where you really break down each step of the problem. Whereas just appending let's, th let's think step by step wasn't really increasing the, improving the accuracy. So there are some, perhaps some replication concerns with let's, let's think step by step, but, um, if you do like spell out all the different steps in your examples of the of the solution, then the model will do better. And I I do think that perhaps you know in the near future someone might be able to do this with text to image generation, where you break down the prompt into you know first let's draw a blue triangle, then let's add a green cube on top of the blue triangle, and so on. And if maybe if you if you can do it this way, you can get around some of the some of the limitation of current models. Isn't that already something, a feature of the Dolly API? At least like on the, on their blog post, they have something where they they have a flamingo that you can add into Bixby or remove it or move it to the right or the left. Yeah. So you can, you can do in painting and you can gradually iterate, but that's not something that's done automatically. What I'm thinking about would be like a model that learns to do this similarly to chain of thought prompting, you know, like to, to. So there is a model that just came out uh, a few days ago that I, I, I tweeted about that does something a little bit different, but um, along the same broad lines. It, uh, so it's breaking down the prompts, the compositional prompts of the diffusion models into distinct prompts, and then has this compositional diffusion model that has compositional operators like and uh, that can combine, that can generate first. Um, embeddings for, for example, if you want uh, a blue cube and a red cube, it will generate first embedding for a blue cube and for a red cube. And then we'll use a compositional operator to combine these two embeddings together. So it's kind of like hard coding into the, the architecture compositional operations. And I, I think, you know, my intuition is that this is not the right solution for the long term because you don't want, you know, again, like the Peter lesson and blah, blah, blah. You don't want to hard code too much in the architecture of your model. And I think you can learn that stuff with the right architecture. Um, we see that in language models, for example, you need to hard code any syntactic structure, any knowledge of grammar in language models. So I think you don't need to do it either for uh, vision language models. Um, but in the short term, it seems to be working better than DALI 2, for example, if you do it this way. Right, so you split your sentence uh, with the end, and then you com combine those embeddings to uh, generate the image. Um, I think, yeah, as you said, it's probably the general solution is as difficult as um, you know solving the understanding of of language because you you would need to like see in general how in a sentence the different objects relate to each other, and uh, so to split it effectively, it would be like require. Um, a deep understanding. I'm curious, what, what do you think would be kind of the new innovation? So imagine when we're in 2024 or even 2023, 
and and Gary Marcus is, is complaining about something on Twitter um, because for me like Dolly was not very high resolution the, the first one and then we got like Dolly two that couldn't you know generate text or um, yeah do um, you know faces or or maybe that's something from the API not very uh, an AI problem but and then Imagine came along and and did something much more photorealistic that could generate text. And of course, there's like some problems you mentioned, um, but you know, do you think in 2023 we, we would just like work on those like compositionality problems one by one, and <laughs> we would get like three objects like blue on top of, of of red and top of of green, or would it be like something very different? Like, because uh, yeah, I guess there there, there there are like some long tail um, problems in in you know solving fully the problem of generating images. But but I, I don't see what it would look like. Would it be like just like imagine a little bit different or uh, or something completely different? So I think um, my intuition is that yeah, well, these, these models will keep getting better and better at this kind of compositional task, um, and it's gonna be it's gonna I, I think it's gonna happen probably gradually, just like language models have been getting better and better at arithmetic, first doing like you know two-digit uh, operations and then three-digit and with Palm, perhaps more than that, uh, or with the right channel of thought prompting, more than that. But it still hits a ceiling and you get diminishing returns. Um, and, you know, that will remain the case as long as we can't find a way to basically um, approximate some form of... Um, Symbol, symbolic-like reasoning in these models with things like variable binding. So um, I'm very interested in current efforts to um, augment transformers with things like episodic memory, where you can <clears throat> um, store uh, things that start looking like variables and do some operations and then like, have read and write operations. To some extent, the work that's been done by uh, the team at Anthropic, um, led by Crisola and, and the people like Catherine Olson, uh, which I think is really fantastic, uh, is already shedding light on how transformers, not just vanilla transformers, um, <clears throat> in fact, they're using toy models without MLP layers, so just attention-only transformers, can um, have some kind of, 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 of implicit memory where they can store and retrieve information and do read and write operations in subspaces of the model. Um, but I think to move beyond the gradual improvement uh, that we've seen for tasks such as mathematical reasoning and so on from language models to something that can more reliably and more generalize, like in a way that can generalize better, perform these, these uh operations for arbitrary digits, for example, we need something that's um, uh, probably uh, some form of um, uh, modification of the architecture that ena enables uh, more robust forms of viable binding and manipulation in a fully differentiable architecture. Now, if I knew exactly what form that would take, then you know I would be uh, funding uh, the next uh, a uh, startup that gets uh, six six hundred million dollars in Series B, or maybe I would just open source it. I don't know, but uh, in any case, uh, I would be famous. So I don't I don't know exactly how what form that would take. I know there is a lot of exciting work on like somehow augmenting transformers with memory. There's some stuff from the Sch the Schmidt Huber lab uh, recently on like fast weight transformers that looks exciting to me, but I haven't done a deep dive yet. Um, so I'm expecting a lot of research on that stuff in, in the coming year. And maybe then we'll get a discontinuous improvement of text to image models too, where all of a sudden, instead of like gradually being able to do like three objects, a red cube on top of a blue cube and then four objects and gradually like that, all of a sudden would we'll get to like arbitrary compositions. I, I'm not excluding. As you said, if you, if you knew what the future would look like, you would be uh, funding a, a Series B startup in the Silicon Valley not um, talking on, on a podcast. Um, yeah, I think I think this is a, an amazing conclusion because it you know, opens a window for what, what is going to happen next. Um, and um, yeah, thanks for being uh, on the podcast. I, I hope people will read all your tweets 
all the threads on compositionality, DALI, GP3, because I've I learned personally a lot from them. Uh, do you, do you want to give a quick shout out to your to your Twitter Twitter account or a website or something? Uh, sure. You can follow me at uh, uh, at Raphael Millier on Twitter. That's Raphael with PH, the French way, and my last name Millier, M I L L I E R E. Uh, you can follow my publications at RaphaelMillier.com. And I just want to quickly like mention this event that I'm organizing with Guy Marcus at the end of the month because that might interest some people who enjoy the conversation and compositionality. So basically, I've been disagreeing with Gary on Twitter about uh, uh, how extensive the limitations of current models are with respect to compositionality. And I, there's something that I really like, um, a model of collaboration that uh, emerged initially from, from economics, but that's been applied to other fields in science called adversarial collaboration, which involves collaborating with people you disagree with to try to uh, have productive disagreements and settle things with like fast variable predictions and, and things like that. So in this spirit of adversarial collaboration, instead of, you know, I think Twitter amplifies disagreements rather than allowing reasonable productive discussions. I suggested to Gary that we organize an event together, a workshop, inviting a bunch of experts in compositionality and AI to try to work things, these questions out together. So we, he, he was enthusiastic about this and we, we organized this event online at the end of the month. That's, uh, uh, you know, free for to attend uh you can register at compositionalintelligence.github.io um and yeah if you're interested in that stuff uh please do join the workshop it should be it should be fun and thanks for having me on the podcast that was a blast yeah sure i will i will definitely join i will add a link uh below i, I can't wait to see you and and gary disagree on things and make <laughs> predictions and uh, yeah, see you around. The inside view. The inside view. The inside view. And this is the end of the episode. My current goal for the channel is to become the number one channel called The Inside View. So if you've enjoyed this podcast, I would suggest leaving a rating on Spotify, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, or subscribing on YouTube so that when we Google The Inside View podcast, the first one is not an inside view about sports, but the inside view about the future of humanity and artificial intelligence. I wish you a great day and see you in the next episode.